introduce with a glass of wine in my hand this day. Uh, this afternoon's speaker uh, in the Chair's Lecture Series, Dr. Julie Spriegelin. Uh, many of you, I think, were probably here. Uh, you interviewed over a year ago now, right? Uh, end of November last year. End of November last year. Uh, many of you were probably in attendance at Toby's talk a year ago, uh, but uh, since then he, uh, he was actually the, uh, uh, the successful and preferred candidate from the symbiosis search. Uh, he's now here. Uh, his lab is under construction on the eighth floor of the zoo tower, and you're currently spread all over uh, the, uh, the two buildings that the department occupies. Uh, but either way, I think uh, things are moving along. Uh, for you, and you're also the lead newbie uh, in the chair's <laughs> newly minted lecture series. So without uh, wasting your precious time, the floor is yours, and uh, please enjoy. All right, thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I was kind of thinking about what to uh, present after hearing the first two uh, lectures in, in, in the series, and it's not like I have you know, any uh, results that are fresh out of the new three-month-old lab now. And so I thought um, there's, there's kind of another theme that I've been thinking a lot over the last year. And after uh, our paper about uh, the third symbi uh, uh, symbiotic uh, component in lichens last year in, in science, a lot of people have been asking me, so where do you see things going forward from here outwards? Like, how do you, how do you see like in uh, evolutionary biology going. And uh, for that matter, students come in and they ask questions now, just in the last weeks, what could you recommend for reading? And it's kind of difficult because uh, last year's discovery changed a number of things, but there's also some historical baggage associated with the study of lichen symbiosis to uh, sort of follow on a theme that Mike introduced during his first uh, uh, lecture in this series, historical baggage that frames uh, the study of our uh, system in such a way that it makes it very difficult to ask questions going into the future. So I've, uh, early this year I was uh, invited to put together a review paper, or review slash opinion paper, that would kind of summarize where I see things going in the future uh, in like an evolutionary biology. So this talk is kind of an experiment. You're kind of a test audience in a way. I'm testing some new ideas and I'm actually re uh, really looking forward to getting some feedback from you as well uh, on uh, how I'm trying to articulate some of these ideas. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of a walk on what got us to like in evolutionary biology now and, and uh, where it could be going in the future. So I guess I'll be clicking on here. Probably a good place to start would be with a lichen. This is a lichen thallus. And this is how people would have perceived the lichen in the first half of the 19th century as an organism uh, of its own. It was for quite a long time uh, accorded rank as its own kingdom. And people thought of this as, as one organism. And as many of you know, um, a Swiss botanist came along uh, around the 1860s and kind of broke this idyllic view and uh, basically was able to prove for the first time that a single organism was uh, composed of two component, component organisms. And what he basically proposed is that you have something like a burrito here, and although he didn't use those words in 1867, and uh, it consists of a what you might think of as a fungal tortilla, and then you have sort of green veggies on the inside which belong to the plant kingdom. So it was a chimera of two different kingdoms. And this coming only a decade after Darwin introducing the concept of natural selection was quite controversial. But as I mentioned last year in my uh, job talk, and some of you may remember that reference, the discovery of this thing that came to be called symbiosis gave permission to or allowed people to go out and see this phenomenon in other systems. And so in really rapid succession, symbiosis was described from this, this chimeric living together of different kingdoms was described from a whole array of different systems, ranging from ectomycorrhizal fungi on plant roots uh, in actually very close to the same decade as the description of lichens. Much later on, the discovery of um, uh, bacterial endosymbionts in insects, such as in the cicada, ectomycorrhizal fungi on the insides of plant cells, um, the squid vib vibrio symbiosis, the vibrio bacteria inhabiting a special organ on the squid, our own microbiome tube worms in uh, deep sea vents. So all of these symbiotic systems but one have something in common. And to this day, 
uh, there's just one standout amongst them. Basically, if you were to remove one of the symbiotic partners, the lesser or minor symbiotic partner in just about any one of these images, you would still be left with something that looks very much like uh, what you see in this picture. So if you remove the fungi off the mycorrhizal root, you still have a plant root. If you remove the uh, bacterial endosymbionts from the cicada, you still have a cicada. It's going to be a dead cicada, but it will still be a cicada. Um, and so on and so forth. You still have a squid. But if you take the lichen down into its component parts, you have this. And this is still unique amongst described symbioses. Lichens are entirely self-constructing. They are essentially, for better or for worse, microbial partners. The fungus in its non-symbiotic state, the alga in its non-symbiotic state. And when they come together, they construct something that is three-dimensional in, in many cases, highly complex, self-replicating, and with specific fractal patterns that are characteristic to each lichen species. Um, this is this is unlike any other described symbiosis. And we don't know how they do it. If you would create something like this in sci-fi literature, or for that matter, invent something like this that would be able to do it, it would be a much sought after uh, model system. Because basically, it wears its symbiosis on its sleeve. It, everything that happens compositionally and regulatorily within the symbiotic system translates to something that it shows on the outside. All the symbiosis consists of external cell-to-cell -cell wall contact. So why hasn't it been done? Or why is it not a model system? And the reason for that is quite simple. The component parts grow extremely slowly, and it's virtually impossible to synthesize them into, into a lichen in vitro. So this being the 19th century, people were uh, thinking about also not just the concepts of symbiosis and, and chimeras and du dualism and things like that, but also about Darwin and uh, the origin of species by natural selection that have been introduced around the same time. And this gentleman, Johannes Reinke, in 1895, published a long, multi-hundred page treatise on how evolutionary concepts could be translated to the lichen symbiosis. And he introduced a variety of concepts. I'm going to read off three quotes. They're a little bit long but they're important for the context of the rest of the talk. Uh, the first, the diversity of body plans shows that there are many optima of adaptation. So adaptation occurs there, and a further reference to, to Darwin after that. The fungus that resides in the lichen forms with its respective alga, a unit, the consortium, and this can be contrasted against all fungi in that its body plan is adapted to carbon dioxide assimilation. And finally, no doubt the fungus determines specific parts of the lichen thallus, such as apothecia, which are sexual fruiting bodies of the fungus. But in the thallus form, it is the consortium that speaks to us. It is here that we encounter adaptive traits that can only be acquired by the consortium. And this last quote is very important because, well, I suppose this, this necessitates the introduction of the duck rabbit. So this is the Wittgenstein duck rabbit, which if you're not familiar with, how many people see a duck and how many, see, how many see, people see a duck first when they see this? And I'm just curious how many people see a rabbit? It's interesting. It's, it's more balanced than I thought it would be. Um, what Reinke did in that last quote is he allowed the, he allowed two concepts to exist in parallel with, with the lichen, and for that matter throughout, throughout his treaties. He allowed for component parts of the lichen, but he also allowed the consortium, as it exists, to have its own attributes. And uh, this is something which, is, which was later described in separate disciplines as emergent property. The property uh, whereby you cannot break anything down and assign its attributes to its component parts. So essentially, Reinke was seeing the duck and the rabbit, uh, and allowing the duck and the rabbit at, to happen uh, at the same time. Um, I'm going to go back to the duck rabbit for a second, because this is, this is an important point. The duck rabbit is essentially anathema to systematists. Systematists have a very hard time dealing with duck rabbits, because to classify things, you're going to need to have either a duck or a rabbit. You're going to need to make some sort of decision. And it was the Canadian biology historian Jan Sapp who said that lichen symbiosis is an abomination to systematists, because they can't deal with it. And so, they have a predilection to lean towards one or the other. And so it was. So 
At the same time, Reinke came under fire, not surprisingly, from systematists. And uh, a movement built over the next decades, over the 1920s and 30s, to re-examine lichens from the context of their fruiting bodies, because that's how everything was being classified at the time. And the fruiting bodies are, of course, fungal. Uh, the fruiting bodies, the sexual fruiting bodies that you see on the surfaces of a lot of lichens. And so right around 1932, this guy, professor at Uppsala University, came along and he wrote, and this will be the last long quote for a while, all previously undertaken attempts at systematics place too much weight on which algae are in the consortium and what level of sophistication the thallus has achieved. The systematic units, therefore, contain not phylogenetically coherent fungi, but instead fungi that have convergently achieved the same level of sophistication and parasitized the same alga. And so he's leaning very much towards, it's going to have to be a rabbit, folks. <laughs> In 1939, only a few years after Nanfeld, Eugen Thomas came by, at the, uh, finished his thesis, rather, at the, uh, at the University of Zurich. And what he did was quite remarkable. Various people had claimed to be able to resynthesize the lichen from its component parts before, but he got photographs of it. And he was able to replicate it over and over again. He didn't get a beautiful, natural looking lichen like I showed in some of the first pictures, but he got something that was more than, more than a plaque on a petri dish. And that's shown here in the, in the right photo. On the left, these little colonies are the, the, the fungal colonies that he got. And he thought, well, they're doing really different things when they're in culture versus in symbiosis. So we just need a parallel naming system. So he gave the things in culture a name, and he gave the name of the lichen that had forever and a day already been the name of the lichen to the thing that, that he synthesized. Along came, around the same time, an Italian botanist by the name of Raffaele Ciferi. And he took this further, and he said, uh, all lichen fungal components need separate names from the name of the lichen. And the reason he argued so strongly for it is he claimed to have been able to experimentally synthesize uh, cases where one fungus was involved in two different lichen symbioses. And so he said, if that's the case, then we need a way to keep these things separate, especially if one fungus can be involved in different, different lichen symbioses. Uh, this whole case was taken to the 1950 uh, International Botanical Congress in Stockholm, and Nanfelt mentioned on the previous page, the guy who was heavily leaning towards the rabbit idea, uh, was one of the hosts of the International Botanical Congress, and they had a very good representation of systematists who said, we need to solve this once and for all. We have hundreds of names from Raffaele Ciferi, some from Eugen Thomas that are proliferating in the literature. We need to bring order into this thing. And they got a clause into the code of nomenclature that says, for nomenclatural purposes, names given to lichens shall apply to their fungal component. The end. <laughs> and so a dual naming system was no longer allowed. They also said, All, we don't know what Shafari found, doesn't, make, doesn't, doesn't matter to us anyway. As far as we're concerned, one lichen equals one fungus, and we've never seen convincing evidence to the contrary. There was not a whole lot of experimental evidence at the time, but it was done. And this set the stage for 65 years of fungal research on lichens, because the, the, the scoop, the thing you get, the biggest reward for many people working with lichens is the ability to name something. And so it shifted research strongly in the direction of looking at fungal characters. You can see where this is going with the, with the historical baggage. Um, there was a decade of research on fruit body ontogeny. There was a ton of research on the specific structure of the sac, which contains the spores and how they eject and whether there's little bits of starch on the inside. Decades and hundreds of papers. And then, of course, starting it from the 1990s onwards, there was molecular phylogenetics of the fungus. And this really changed things because it allowed people to go in and test things that had been sort of out of reach before that. I'm going to just go through sort of a picture book of some of the molecular phylogenetic evolution results. Um, one very popular and common result is one lichen, many fungal species. Something that had previously carried one name turns out to contain these things that people are calling cryptic species. Fair enough, usually with a little bit of work you can figure out what the differences are, sometimes slight chemical differences, but you can, you can pin something down. A more surprising result that they found echoed the warnings of Raffaele Giferi in the 1950s. Namely, that you would get two very different lichen species, but they ended up containing the same fungus. 
in this case, even historically assigned to different genera in 1859 and 1869, Sticta and Dendrisca colon. They have exactly the same fungus on the inside, down to every last nucleotide. And more examples came up. This, in this case, a pair with, with one more recently described species from 1993, but then another very old, well-recognized pair that goes back all the way to the uh, early fog of lichenological time, 1798 and, and 1827, they have the same fungal species. They look similar, perhaps, in some ways, but they also look different enough that any student can sort them into piles. Um, uh, these two species, Briaria torquios and Briaria fremontii, um, and then another result of this molecular revolution is the discovery of relatedness at the next higher level uh, of things that look very different from each other. Body plan saltations that have been assumed to have been more distantly related but are found to have much more closely related fungi. So this led in 2011 to a group from the Field Museum in Chicago publishing this paper, Goodbye uh, Morphology. Um, there's about four things to be said about this. Uh, you would think that this is a bit of a provocative and flippant title for um, somebody who's trying to sell their discipline also to practitioners and so on. Uh, but Torsten Lumsch was the president of the International Association of Lichenology at the time. And these are very influential people in terms of deciding who gets research money. So this is very much a prominent uh, paradigm. There are a couple other things one can say. Um, for over 90 years, it had been known that the algae that live within lichens can be very promiscuous in terms of which species they occur in. Uh, they can occur in dozens of different lichen species. That never really seemed to bother anyone. Basically, what they're reporting in a review paper is that fungi can do the same. The only reason this is a problem is because of that clause in the 1950 code. The only reason they write goodbye morphology is because the naming of systems is tied to fungi in the 1950 code. They don't acknowledge actually that, that tension, but without that clause, there would be no goodbye morphology. It would simply be, oh, fungi are also promiscuous in terms of the different symbioses they can occur in. Um, what else can you say? Uh, another way of flipping this around would be, why does the morphology not reflect the fungus if that had been the prediction the entire time? And that is something that we ended up exploring with work that I started at the University of, uh, of Montana in 2011, shortly after that paper came out. So we took advantage of genomics methods to see what caused the differences that had been upheld for over 100 years in two different lichen species that were common in the mountains of western Montana. I'm not going to repeat the, in the, all the details of the of, of the study, which were the things I talked about in my job talk almost a year ago. But in brief, uh, we explored whether or not there was a regulatory difference, such as differential gene expression that led to one being more yellow than the other and having a few other different features, or whether there was something else that was uh, perhaps compositionally different uh, that had not been anticipated, and it was the latter. We found that there was a previously undetected fungus that lived in this thick, uh, reinforced layer, basically the tortilla part of the, of the burrito. And it was embedded within this, very, very difficult to see with any kind of light microscopy, but with fluorescent microscopy, we built probes to be able to highlight it because we had sequenced the metagenome, we had sequences, we, we knew it was there, and then we, we basically made it light up with fluorescent microscopy. And lo and behold, it's about 10 to 12 times more abundant in this body plan or in this species here to four species than in this one. So while we weren't able to prove causation, we were able to show a, a very strong correlation with the presence of this additional fungus that occurred in the form of a yeast in that outside layer called the cortex. We've found in the meantime that this is not a one-off. So Vera Tuovinen, who'll be joining my lab as a postdoc, starting in January from Uppsala University, she did the fluorescent microscopy work for that previous paper, and she's gone on to do some of her own work in Uppsala and will be doing more here as well. And she's found a completely different group of fungi called Tremella from the Tremellomycetes are doing the same thing within quite a few different lichens, and she's visualized that as well. We've not tied it back in this case to specific uh, morphological differences, but things are heading in that direction. 
it's been known for several years that there are very rich bacterial communities in this reinforced cortex layer. Cortex layer. Here the, the color scheme is a little bit different. Red are the bacteria. There's hundreds of bacterial cells in there. So we know that this is a very rich bioactive layer. Uh, what is it again? To go back to the image that we started with, it's this, this reinforced layer, which has just always, forever and a day, been called some sort of organ of the whole, just been called the cortex. But when you dig into it a little bit deeper and start doing microscopy with different methods, it has a lot of interesting characteristics. Here in a scanning electron micrograph, you can see that it's an extracellular matrix that goes around these broken off, they basically look like macaronis that have been broken off. These are fungal hyphae. And it cements everything in between. A little bit like the frosting has been uh, spread over the thing. And then it hardens. It's very hard and rigid when dry. And it's quite flexible when moist. And it's been suggested already in the 1920s that it's responsible for the form and the rigidity of lichens. In fact, it is the thing that holds the lichen into the shape that we think of as characteristic for that lichen. Here in a transmission electron microscope image, uh, with, with fungal cells here, the cell wall, it forms a matrix that people who look at a lot of TEMS have told me uh, looks a lot like uh, an extracellular polysaccharide matrix or basically like a biofilm. Um, there's this interesting and sadly undersighted 1981 study that experimented with what would happen or what kind of method could you use to take this layer selectively off and just look at what it looks like underneath. And they settled on uh, aerial laundry detergent as being containing a, a, a specific bacillus enzyme that was uh, effective at removing this layer without attacking the fungal cell walls. And what they found underneath this layer, if they would wash only that off, was basically a jigsaw puzzle arrangement of cells within. And, uh, and this, was, this was also quite, quite surprising to, to people at the time. What is this layer actually, what does this layer actually consist of? Um, we don't know is the short answer. This is uh, a, basically a flow chart of a series of extractive steps done to study lichen polysaccharides. For the longest time, it's been assumed that this layer was full of a variety of different beta-glucans. And I'm just going to shorten this and go straight to the reason we can't say that that's the case, and that it's the very first step after the lichen is cleaned, dried, and defatted, it is washed in 10% potassium hydroxide, which I've done, and it removes that layer. So that layer is uh, discarded as lichen residue, and all further analyses were done on cell walls, which is why the result that beta-glucans dominate lichen uh, cell walls uh, it validates and, and tracks with that of other fungi. All of that, be that as it may, there's a lot we don't know about this layer, but we know it's bioactive. It contains specific microbes. We don't know its chemical composition. We don't know a whole lot about its physical properties, other than to say, this is stiff. This is somehow a little bit more floppy. Um, we don't know what a healthy lichen looks like without the cortical microbes. We've never found one that doesn't have it, which strongly implies that they're a part of it. But everything we know about fungal and other microbial cell biology tells us to expect that there should be uh, basically an exchange of goods and services across the uh, membranes of the different uh, microbial components involved, osmotrophic interactions. So we, we know from the study that we published last year that symbiotic composition at a very minimum can correlate with symbiotic outcome, with what you see as the lichen. I didn't go into these as examples, but briefly, these we know also correlate with the uh, photosynthesizing partner on the inside. This is associated with the green alga. alga. This is associated with the cyanobacterium. And this is associated with two different species of green alga. So that can also strongly correlate with the symbiotic outcome. So I'm going to try to walk through sort of a theoretical framework for how I think things might be working to come out with different body plans. And that would... I, it, I'm going to just, I'm going to see if this works. This is the part of the test phase. Stop me, stop me midway if this isn't working. But hypothetically, we've got on the top, we've got a fungus, and at the bottom, we've got an, an alga. And we've got the area of a square. And I'm just going to ask you to assume that everything within the area of a square is the hypothetical ver, uh, variability contained within a species. If this doubles in size, we're talking about two species, three species of lichen. And so the assumption at the very beginning may have been 
uh, reasonably that a lichen, like here, shown here, <coughs> um, consists of a single fungus and a single alga. I need to get some water here. It was quickly recognized that algae, the algal species, could occur in many different types of lichens. As I said, it was kind of promiscuous with regard to the species it occurs in. Um, the goodbye morphology era came along and taught us that at a minimum, the same fungal species could occur in two different lichens, sometimes in three or four different lichens. So we've doubled the size of the fungal square now. And our work brought in another category, basically, which I'm going to just put under the broad umbrella of cortical microbial components. It doesn't have to be a yeast, it could be bacteria, but there's always something in there, in this layer, that helps shape the lichen into what it is. If you put these together, you get a zone of overlap, which leads, in this theoretical framework, to a symbiotic outcome. In the case of the lichens I just showed you from, from our study, it was these hair lichens. Here it's a species of hypogymnia. And I'm postulating, basically, that if you change the composition of one of the components, you can achieve different symbiotic outcomes by basically in a mix and match type of game with the different uh, players that are involved. And the most labile of those appears to be the cortical microbial components. This can go on and on, so that in the case of this particular species, we know that all of these different symbiotic outcomes that have been treated as different lichen species contain the same fungus. You can scale this up to look at how evolution worked in the lichen symbiotic system. We published this paper last year, and uh, in this case, I, I, I'm not showing the tree, but I'll just describe it in brief. Basically, you had 100 million years of evolution where uh, the symbiotic outcomes associated with the dominant fungal component of w for which we made a tree, an eight locust tree, looked roughly like in A and C. Notice the scale bars here are, um, the scale bars between this and this are the same, so these are directly comparable, and between here and here they're directly comparable. So basically all the outcomes up to a certain point looked like this, Right around here, every subsequent tip of the tree, the fungus is associated with secondarily acquired cyanobacteria, which live in their own little uh, compartments, which, which are these little things, these bull's eyes at the middle of, of the individual lichens. As soon as cyanobacteria appear on the scheme, there's a huge size increase and thickness increase and fruit body size increase. So this suggests that symbiont addition or acquisition can lead to evolutionary saltation. So this also brings in a sort of labile component, and it suggests that that could be the case also for symbionts that we might not be recognizing. So what then of the origin of complexity overall within the lichen symbiosis? I talked about these self-replicating multi-storied structures that, that, uh, that are formed, and they're, they're on the, the right here, and they're paired with uh, lichens that have closely related but more ancestral component primary fungi. What happened to get the lichen to go from here to here, from the left side to the right side? What happened along those different, those different junctures over evolutionary time? So in wrapping up, I'd like to revisit some of the things that Reinke wrote over 100 years ago and offer a series of new postulates that will be kind of a theoretical or, or question framing framework for uh, some of our work in the future. The first, the body plan, has to be the physical realization of the optimization of the entire symbiotic system. We have to work with the body plan if we're going to understand anything about evolution. The second, the lichen symbiosis adapts to optimize carbon assimilation by quorum symbiont response. And by quorum, I mean we have all these different single-celled microbes that are living within this, this reinforcing layer on the outside, they respond in some sort of unison to specific signals that are, that are provided. This may be the leading edge driver of symbiont evolution, of the ev evolution of the various components on the inside. In other words, I'm hypothesizing that the body plan and its evolution, its evolutionary processes, frame the evolution 
that the goodbye mor morphology people were describing that was disconnected from morphology. It has to frame it. The lichen fungus evolves within this context. Finally, relative symbiont input has to be unequal spatially within the lichen. An older part has to have a different input from its different component parts than the younger part of the lichen. And this has to be the case also temporally over the life of the lichen as well as over evolution. And so that's kind of a framework for, for asking questions. It's pretty dense, I, I, I concede, but, um, but it's something that I'm kind of looking forward to discussing. So to revisit the, the duck rabbit, I would argue that by choosing only to see the rabbit, it becomes impossible actually to study how lichens adapt. You have to be able to look at the entire system and be open to what is coming and going out of the various things that influence that ultimate symbiotic outcome. And so with that, I'd like to thank, there's the original duck rabbit, by the way, um, which I'm not thanking, it sounded like that, but um, there's, there's the, the original one from, from Wittgenstein. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the people who contributed photos, discussions, and, uh, and data, and thank you for your attention. Um, probably quite a bit, um, especially when cyanobacteria enter the scene, as was the case uh, with that a few slides back, the acquisition here. We argued that uh, these, these lichens here on the left occupy extremely nutrient-poor environments, basically close to sterile rock faces, oftentimes boulder faces, Antarctica, that kind of thing. Um, cyanobacteria enter the picture. The lichen symbiosis, for I don't want to anth anthropomorphize, but for want of a better word, figures out how to keep them, keep cyanobacteria in a, in a holding uh, vessel on top. All of a sudden, the lichen dramatically increases in size. This isn't, this isn't a one-off either. You see this actually in different points in evolution. Relatively small things struggling along. You see cyanobacteria enter the, the evolutionary tree Thallus size just goes 10 times, 100 times greater. Do you, just to follow, do you ever see non, um, do you ever see diazotrophs that aren't cyanobacteria associated? And then microbial population? Um, like from other, like from proteobacteria? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Alpha proteobacteria in particular. Sorry, right, if you go back to the previous slide, but now the previous slide is much Later. I, think, I think it's the second, the last slide, right? The one that was dense. Yeah. No, no, particularly the one that was very dense. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> so I'm unclear as to whether the items on the right hand side are your beliefs, your observations, or things to test, or some kind of. They are postulates. They're postulates. They, and, and within that, I kind of break that down below into things to test. Um, in the context of this opinion piece, they basically said, feel free to speculate. Like, don't make the whole thing speculation. But there comes a point when, you're, when you want to push in a certain direction to ask certain questions, but you cannot possibly have the data to go all the way with it. You're very adamant that it must, it must, it must. So it sounded like you were pretty sure. Mm. No, but th I actually am re reasonably sure that something like this is happening because I've seen enough unpublished data to and published and unpublished data and a lot of the a lot of the discordance data between the fungus and the symbiotic outcome strongly supports this as well. There has to be something leading to symbiotic outcomes. I don't think anybody really um, disputes that. So. So, so that, would, that would leave number one rather un uncontroversial, I think. Right, yes. The body plan is, has to be the physical well, realization. Is optimization, of course, is going to make people argue about what's being optimized. Yeah, I wrote it this morning. We can, I mean, <laughs> we, <laughs> we, can, we can work out a, a different word. If, uh, that's, a, that's great input, yeah. <laughs> Reviewer one. <laughs> I want to point out that Dr. Proctor is his mentor. <laughs> Yeah, let me just add your name here. <laughs> I'll stop now. Yeah, I mean, no, you're welcome to go on, but. Uh, next
Now, now that we know that uh, prokaryotes are also part of this little lichen party, would it be any easier to go back and try and grow the stuff in the lab, knowing that you need to sprinkle in a bit of cyanobacteria? Um, the cyanobacteria are not a problem. The, the thing that uh, we are not able to get into culture is, uh, is this thing. And, and this is problematic because it is virtually ubiquitous over 140 million years of evolution down one of the most important branches of the fungal tree. And uh, this, this thing. And we've tried, and we're working with a bunch of different groups to try to get this thing into culture. This is the, the second fungus, the Basidiomycete yeast, which I talked about in greater detail last year and just kind of brushed over at this point. We can't culture that. And until we can, we can't do that experiment. Are you trying to do it? Uh, I don't have anything plated out here yet, oh. but yes. <laughs> yeah, that's coming. Felix. So <laughs> very well. But uh, so it doesn't make any difference. Is the black one, uh, you know, absorbing heat better and the, the light one not? Or it, it, that, in other words, you can have emergent properties, but if emergent properties don't have a, a, a phenotypic consequence in terms of uh, selection on them, then it's immaterial. That is, that is actually an excellent point. So there are, partially because things went so much in the fungal direction, there are basically no studies that look at the selective advantage or disadvantage, the evidence of selection on the entire uh, uh, consortium or thing put together all at once. There is a ton of ecophysiological evidence for adaptation related to switching of pigments depending on habitat. So things switch habitats over the tree of life and then they'll acquire melanins. The melanins and or osmic acid or atranarin, the three main uh, pigments that, uh, that are found in the lichen cortex, are, have been shown to block out not just UV but basically the, they filter the entire light spectrum uh, for the advantage of the entire system. Um, you see anecdotal evidence of selection happening after a summer like they had in British Columbia, where in extremely dry and uh, uh, what's, the, what's the posh term for sunned, uh, insulated <laughs> habitats, thank you, is that on the tip of my tongue? Uh, in stream, extremely dry and insulated habitats, you've got mass dieback. You've got mass dieback in treetops. Uh, uh, as opposed to the lower canopy. So the, the places that were most exposed to the borderline conditions for survival of the symbiosis were penalized. And, 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 uh, and then you have survival. Actually creating data out of that is something that I would like to do with a student here. Have you ever looked at the effects of air pollution on this? I grew up in an area with lots of lichens, and one of the things that happened was an increase in smell through smoke. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, I've observed that. I've, I've not studied that. There are a bunch of people. It's interesting. Ecologists have no problem with the duck rabbit. So a lot of people uh, go and, and they study whole lichens and look at lichen responses and lichen populations and so on relative to pollution, relative to environmental gradients, relative to global warming. Um, and they don't break it out and say, well, yeah, but the fungus. And uh, so... So I think, no, I haven't done any of, any of that work myself, but, it, but there is actually a decent body of literature on that. Also about color changes over the seasons. Yes? How does the microbes play into the duck rabbit? So the, the duck rabbit, I, 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 was, I worked with a bunch of other metaphors um, and, and kind of settled on the duck rabbit. It's an imperfect metaphor in a way because it's not, it's not that the rabbit is, is the fungus and the duck is, is the microbe or something. It's the ability... It's the inability to see two things simultaneously. And uh, in this hypothetical metaphor, the duck would be the totality, and the rabbit would be the fungus. It's difficult to think about fungal evolution and think about system ev evolution simultaneously. Either you focus on one, and then you're focused on system evolution, which, which could include a lot of moving parts, including the fungus, 
or you focus on one, as the systematists have done, and basically say, okay, we're just we're running with the fungus now. And that's, that is the, so it's, it's, it's a principle from philosophy. It's applied in uh, similar situations where it's difficult to bring two things together that are impossible to see at the same time. But it's an imperfect metaphor. There's also the chocolate cake metaphor, but I'm not going to go there. <laughs> So the analogies to bacterial biofilms are, are sort of really obvious to me as a microbiologist. I'm just wondering if you know who makes the polysaccharides that are, that are part of that, that cortex that you're talking about? That's the million dollar question. Oh, excellent. Yeah. He <laughs> <laughs> has a million dollars in his back pocket. <laughs> yeah, no, that... I bet it's the bacteria. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I would. I, I suspect you're right. I suspect that these guys are are doing something, and it could be. It's very difficult. It's there's a bit of a chicken and there's it's, there's a chicken and egg and and third thing problem <laughs> that that results from this because they're different different players. It's also possible that the fungus from within secretes something, but but that is only switched on in contact with certain triggers. And figuring out which is doing which requires basically nanosims. It requires visualizing stuff at a molecular level. And, but also knowing what molecule you're looking for, which is the bigger problem. When you do that detergent thing, wash the layer off, does it come back? No. Well, they're dead. They're nuked at that point, yeah. <laughs> yeah, those are like prepared for scanning electron microscopy, so they've been gold sputtered in the whole thing. That's, that's an, I mean, now I'm going deep into the realm of speculation, even further than on the last slide that Heather was talking about. But um, that's a question that actually connects back to Andy's regarding pollution. Um, potentially, yes. Potentially, those would be very interesting systems to study. Because even in polluted environments, you notice, you, you notice disco discoloration. But more interestingly, for dictating what shape the lichen ultimately takes on, you notice contortion. Um, Things that, were, that are otherwise more or less plain or even with slightly up, upturned tips all of a sudden become downturned or curled. And this goes back to the microbial biofilm. It suggests that something is inputting polysaccharides into the biofilm that changes the um, torsion, that changes the outside versus inside uh, pull of the, of the biofilm, the tension in the biofilm, uh, to, to pull it inwards. And that suggests a, a, a chemical modification of the biofilm. So that would be really interesting to look at. In, it's possible that something like that could even be secondarily achieved in a growth chamber. Just give me an idea. How many different bacteria have you found associated with lichens? I, What's the diversity of the bacteria? I, I have not dug into, we've got some new data that we'd like to look at for bacteria that is just in the process of being assembled, but I have not gone into the bacterial uh, field because what we did for this was um, poly A selected metatranscriptome. So we were looking actually only at eukaryotes for this study. Now we're going to be looking at some. The studies that I showed that have been published previously did sorting at a very high level. Firmicutes, alpha proteobacteria, um, the fish probes that were used, the fluorescent in situ hybridization probes that were used to visualize these were generic catalog probes. So nothing very specific has been done. And that's something I'd also like to change, because I suspect that um, a little bit like Vibrio and the squid, I suspect that there's something very specific that always has to be in there. But we won't know if we don't look. So it's a little bit of a needle in a haystack. But I think by replicating the system, getting different metagenomes from different places, taking uh, PCR primers out of the question, out of the equation, and looking at whole metagenome data, I think there's a way that we can go in and see, are there any constant bacterial members? Where are they? How many are they? Can we, visu can we develop specific probes to visualize just those? And then, and then, of course, parse their genomes. I was just thinking when you have different structures, maybe you have different bacteria that are triggering different signaling pathways resulting in those structures. Yeah. Yeah. 
we're going to be talking a lot, I think, <laughs> when, when we have some candidates. Yes? Uh, I'm thinking about phenotypic plasticity. And is, can you say much about plasticity in these guys that does, may or may not reflect changes in the, the roles of the players in the consortium, as you call it? So are, are there any guys that exhibit plasticity, especially in what you call body type, that is independent of a change in any of the players? Um, it's difficult to ask that question because I don't have the experimental data on all of the players, but my intuition would be to answer yes. So you do have, you have these things, like to go up to this 1798 example, you have these things that have been treated as different species forever. Um, there's a discontinuity, not just morphological, but also ecological discontinuity between this and this. But there is a variation within this, and there, what you might call phenotypic plasticity, and there is within this as well. That may we, reflect a change in, in a, a bacteria in it, or the third fungal player, or it, is your feeling like that is what I would say true plasticity? It's variability without changing any of the players. It's, that's a really, really interesting question. It, it's, it kind of leads to a bigger question, and that is whether some of the terms that are used for things that we think of as being single genome organisms, homo sapiens, for instance, how transferable are they to multi-kingdom assemblages? Uh, is plasticity, is it, is, it, is it the same thing as plasticity? The same thing, uh, a lot of the principles that Darwin leans on in the origin of species, such as heredity, um, heredity becomes something different when it has to put itself back together each time if it has to do that. A lot of these uh, propagate asexually. And, uh, and there's presumably a big reward for staying asexual when it takes so much to get all the players together in the first place. Um, but when you read through The Origin of Species, there's, you know, there are things that, that don't translate. And, and it, it becomes sort of in a different realm. It becomes another duck rabbit situation where it's very tempting to just pull in and say, well, let's just look at the fungus then. Um, but in fact, when you have multiple players, in, in nature, they need the multiple players to get going, right? And so I always try to go back to saying, okay, let's, let's try to generate some data based on what we see and not presuppose the results. Stunned silence. <laughs> Some desire for cheese. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in my in my case, it's beer. So. Good <laughs> <laughs> to go with questions. I guess it's uh, it's Miller time. <laughs> Thank you.